Father Peter Damien has been the teacher for many of us. It goes back to my years in the seminary in 1967, and he's the first one who got me to see and to understand Newman a little bit better. I must say early on I didn't understand Scotus as well, so I've tried to make up for that lost time in, in recent years. And uh, all I can say is the experience of discovering the great love I have for Newman and how that grew, and now to back it up and to see how it fits into our Franciscan tradition, not only with Scotus, who is much clearer, because Scotus is at times hard work, but it's worth the work. And that's the, that's the feeling I can, I can convey to you. It's worth the hard work. But you can't understand SCOTUS if you don't understand Bonaventure, the reason for that last question to Professor Noon. And then you can't understand SCOTUS or Bonaventure if you don't understand St. Francis of Assisi. That's the key. As soon as you can put that together, not only it doesn't stop there, that makes it possible for us to understand St. Maximilian Kolbe, who is thoroughly a Scotist, and others. Well, I don't want to be carried away, but Father Peter Damien Fellner is one who has spent a lifetime reflecting on the possibilities and then the actual connections between the thought of Blessed Scotus and Blessed Newman, and I now invite him to the podium. Thank you, Father Ed. Uh, I'm the third presenter. I'm very fortunate to have been preceded by the Father Ford and <laughs> Dr. Noon. There's a certain amount of familiarity with the typical themes of Cardinal Newman and the grammar of ascent and the very important contributions of SCOTUS and the on the question of abstractive and intuitive cognition are absolutely fundamental to try to appreciate similarities of thought, convergence of, of uh, ways of thinking of two great Oxford figures who didn't speak quite the same English, didn't work concerned with, at least superficially, with the same questions. Uh, Scotus is the great metaphysician. And Newman is the great describer of the data, the phenomena. But I've tried to organize the first part of this conference. Fifty pages of it is simply a collection of texts from Newman, from many of his works, to illustrate the points I'm making in this first part, but to try to point out where the similarities are anchored between on the one hand, Bonaventure Scotus, and the other hand, Newman. And so I present my position, and hopefully you will share my vision of the data. Those who don't can raise questions, and I'm sure questions can be raised. This, this presentation is divided, it's 28 pages or so. I'll try to cover more or less the first 18 this evening and then the, the remainder tomorrow morning. The first part is really two parts. The first is the, you know, the basis for the, 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 uh, the presentation, the comparison of the two. Secondly, the Franciscan context seen in relationship to Newman, and thirdly, the illustration of the points I want to make, basically, by consideration of his life. You might say the development of doctrine as he passed from Anglican background to the, to the Catholic, from, as he put on his epitaph, from the shadows and the images into the light of the truth. So during the eighth centuries of his existence, the University of Oxford was never graced by theologians greater than Blessed John Don Scotus, Blessed John Henry Newman. But rarely, <coughs> rarely have students of Scotus and Newman suggested there might be something more than mere happenstance to link their names in the world of theology, or that their linking might have a significant bearing on the future of Catholic theology. <coughs> 
However, infrequent suggestions of this kind, those making them, cannot easily be dismissed as fanciful persons who mistake groundless hypotheses for reality. The first to hint that similar approaches to the study of theology are shared by these two saintly docked scholars is none other than Blessed John Henry himself. In a letter to Father Faber, dated December the 9th, 1849, Newman clearly states his posi- position on the motive of the Incarnation to be that of Scotus. I consider that to be an extraordinarily important point, because in the final analysis, the metaphysics of Scotus and the epistemology that is attended upon it reflect precisely the ultimate implications of the absolute primacy of Christ, the primary motive of the incarnation. And it's especially important for his understanding of the sacramentality of the world. Here's the text from his letter to Father Faber. Certainly I wish to take the Scotus view on that point, the motive of the incarnation. It seems to be more philosophical, if one has a right so to talk, to throw the difficulty on creation as if creation is the great mystery. And if the supreme condescended to create, to partake in creation was involved, that is, on the part of the creator. But as I understand the Scotus view, it simply is that he would have become incarnate even had man not sinned. But when man sinned, it was for our redemption. In matter of fact, the end was to make satisfaction, and this is what I have expressed at page 35, uh, talking about the uh, his position in respect to the, uh, uh, the re- relation between the incarnation and our redemption. And it's a very good way of expressing the relationship between the primary and the secondary purpose of the incarnation. In the same letter, Newman also evidences sympathy for scotistic positions in sacramental theology, and in an earlier letter to uh, uh, William George Ward, 1849, concerning the forthcoming definition of the Immaculate Conception, very much involving the theology of Scotus, he (coughs) he says this, However, returning to the question of development, it is wonderful. St. Thomas and St. Bernard flatly silenced which is not meant in a, in a, in a, uh, a mean sense, but simply a point of view that his theory of development is closely linked to the thesis of Scotus on the incarnation, the absolute primacy, and the Marian mode of that absolute primacy, which we may say is the immaculate conception. I should also mention here, I don't go into it in any detail, but that an earlier Anglican work Lectures on Justification, Newman makes many references to Scotus theology to support the particular interpretation he gives to justification and, uh, 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 and the, uh, and the pro- problems, uh, problems occasioned by the uh, views of Luther. Further comments in this letter on the various theologians of the day, including Derlinger and Peroni, who in one way or another opposed his theory of doctoral development, showed he regarded the approach of Scotus as implicitly supporting this theory. Given the key role of the absolute primacy of Christ, both in Scotistic theology and metaphysics, we may assume, brief though these comments be, that Newman in a general way was sympathetic to many of the major themes characteristic of Scotus's metaphysics. Nor is it illogical that someone who had come to abandon an initial acceptance of Calvinistic predestinationism should find in Scotus's defense of the absolute primacy of Christ and of the Immaculate Conception exactly the right stress on the goodness of God to set in perspective the overstress on sinful man in Calvin and on sinless man in Pelagius without sacrificing the primacy of charity and of the will. We may also see in this contrast the difference between the mystery of predestination in Christ, as Scotus explains it, and the predestinationism condemned by the Church, the first reflecting the will of God as goodness itself, always ordered in acting, and the second reflecting it as tyrannical, an omnipotent version of the finite will whose defective mode of acting is confused with freedom. Without mentioning names, Newman's Memorandum on the Immaculate Conception underscores precisely this contrast. On the publication of the Grammar of Ascent, 
another perceptive student, both of Newman and of Scotus, the Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, though at first not much impressed, later became enthused on realizing how much of what Newman explains in this classic is for the contemporary audience, in fact, if not in intent, an elaboration of themes found in Scotus and further support for his aesthetic, aesthetical theory of inscape and instress. Newman refused Hopkins the requested permission to write a commentary on the grammar illustrating these very points. Although Newman's reasons for this refusal are not entirely clear, his reply does not include a denial of the thesis Hopkins proposed to demonstrate. Perhaps Newman had some doubts about Hopkins' qualifications to carry off such a study successfully, or that too close an association of the grammar of assent with the more metaphysical language of Scotus would frighten away the very people for whom it had been written, or that the grammar might be interpreted as a criticism of the recent encyclical Etani Patris favoring the promotion of Thomism. In any case, Newman's a praise of Scotus in the idea of a university as the finest theological fruit of Oxford's traditional program of study seems to confirm Hopkins' insight. During the course of a symposium to honor Scotus on the seventh centenary of his birth, held at the former Dun Scotus College near Detroit during the late spring of 1966, I had the privilege of conversing privately with perhaps the greatest Scotist of our times, Father Charles Ballach. And I took the occasion to ask his opinion concerning the possibility and value of a study dealing with correlations between the thought of Scotus and Newman. And his reply was a very positive one, a study which, as far as he knew, had as yet to be undertaken, but should be. A few years later, during the 1970s, Harold Weatherby, an Anglican Thomist, later Greek Orthodox and now deceased, published two studies to illustrate the affinities linking the thought of Scotus, Newman, and Hopkins. His goal was not the promotion of Scotus and Newman. It was rather to show how the theological and metaphysical positions of Scotus opening on the late medieval nominalism and voluntarism, source of so much subsequent subjectivism and idealism, or as the current saying goes, Scotus via Occam and Luther is the granddaddy of Kant and Hegel, are exactly those positions which in Newman have produced the same fruits first among Anglicans and then among Catholics such as Hopkins, and thereafter among the modernists at the turn of the 19th century. Note well, Weatherby is not accusing Scotus and Newman or even Hopkins of formal heresy. Rather, he blames them for sowing the seeds of heresy, for leaving orthodox faith and philosophical certainty to rest solely on a blind act of obedience to authority. To Weatherby, this is worse than a simple denial of some article of the creed. Scotus, Scotism, says Weatherby, is merely agnosticism or nominalism, voluntarism, thinly disguised in pious form, while Newman and Hopkins are simply the current English version of a radical tendency in the Roman Church since the late Middle Age, that is, since Scotus. That leads me to consider here not the only, but one of the central uh, considerations that must be made in order to appreciate whether or not there is some kind of similarity <coughs> like contours in the theological thought and then the broader uh, metaphysical uh, uh, metaphysics involved in our theology at the present time. Because uh, Weatherby is hardly the only person who has indicated that, that Scotus the Scotus is uh, responsible for all of the subjectivism and voluntarism that is current in our, uh, in our times, that his notion of the will is fundamentally that of the arbitrary will of Immanuel, Immanuel Kant. And among them, of course, is uh, some of the, is the excellent Thomists, and he has some wonderful books, but Cornelio Fabro in his last book on Hegel, quite blank, blank, uh, bluntly, I would say almost quite violently, accuses Scotus of being the same type of intellectual character as Hegel. That's really going some. Uh, you'll find very little in Scotus that resembles some of the, uh, some of the wilder ravings of, 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 of Hegel. So what is of prime interest here is not whether be negative assessment of Scotus, Newman, and Hopkins and the Roman Catholic Church, an assessment I quite emphatically do not share. The same thing, of course, is done to Newman. He is made out to be as the father of all forms of modernism at the present time. I think both assessments are fundamentally wrong. <laughs> 
Weatherby's, although his interpretation of those similarities is a radical misrepresentation, Weatherby's observations are valuable, not only because he has spotted a deep affinity linking Scotus and Newman, but what is at the core of that affinity, their position on the critical question arising from interiorization, entering into the heart. Quite often, the enemy rather than the friend first spots a point crucial to some discussion and what in this case could be a most important discovery for the future of Christian thought and the support of faith. I mean, entering into the heart, that is a phrase that is not original with Newman. You will find that is precisely what St. Bonaventure in the Itineradium, which mind's journey to God, is, uh, is discussing. Uh, entry after going out of self into the, the world of, of, uh, of, uh, of, be, uh, uh, of creatures ex, uh, uh, with, we, without us, we must enter into ourselves, enter into our heart. And this is where the critical question ri- rises. rises. Chapters uh, three and four, uh, four are extraordinarily important, and we find also as in the latter part of it, that there are many, many similarities between what some have called the anthropological argument for God's existence, is, through the image and in the I- image, is very similar and uh, uh, in great part to the argument of Newman from conscience to the existence of God. It's an intermediary argument between those as were they are called physical arguments, which is through and in the vestige, and those referred to under the heading today, ontological, not too accurate heading, the proof of St. Anselm, which appears in the fifth, and, uh, the fifth chapter of the Itinerarium without the, without the name, and which is the proof that has been called, as it were, one of the, uh, one of the uh, most elaborate and profound proofs ever worked out for the existence of God. If we see, as it were, that kind of development, uh, uh, there is a real development there in the elaboration of the proof for God's ex- existence. Is how we can understand a great deal more about the contribution of Scotus and also of, of, uh, of of, 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 of Newman. Weatherby is right in saying that Scotus and Newman, unlike the majority of Thomas, except for the transcendental ones, acknowledge the existence of a critical question, or at least that, uh, uh, that aspects of their thought, for instance, those resembling what Thomas, such as Cornelio Fabro, called Hegelian ontotheology, provide valid grounds for ascribing to them a radical affinity with Kant and the overall direction of his idealism in matters epistemological and theological. And with this uh, essay on my part, I hope to show that uh, that is by no means the only possible interpretation. In fact, I would regard it as a fundamentally a misinterpretation. That if anything, they provide, as it were, a very positive and effective effective remedy for the errors of Immanuel Kant. The, uh, 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 uh. But Weatherby failed to see that far from being a pious, blind orthodoxy resting on a notion of the will as absolute, a voluntarism opening the door and Kant's agnosticism, the critical insights of Scotus and Newman are source of a powerful corrective for Kantian deviations. The remedy is, in fact, a genuine, here I'm quoting from the present Holy, uh, uh, Holy Father in one of his recent uh, uh, catechesis, it's a process of interiorize, uh, interiorizing in which reason and willing play a central role. Faith in Christ is received with profound conviction, and one feels a harmonious correspondence between this real conviction and satisfying communion with God. I suspect, as it were, that this passage reflects the influence of Bonaventure on him. This citation from our Holy Father, a great admirer of Newman, reflects a very ancient traditional position on the primacy of the will and charity and its bearing on rationality and conviction, during the Middle Ages and since a hallmark of the Franciscan school. It also reflects that notion of interiorizing to be found in chapters 3 and 4 of St. Bonaventure's Itinerarium Mentis in Deum and in his Christus Unus Omnium Magister. In these works, recently praised by the Holy Father, the seraphic doctor in the footsteps of St. Augustine, but also heeding the directives of St. Francis concerning study, notes the importance of this process, but also the possibility, precisely where we come to the third and the fourth step, the possibility of indifference and secularization. Instead of sanctification of the intellect, of finding only self instead of God, 
Instead of leading further to God, the process tragically may stop only at self, ending in what Bonaventure understands by spiritual vanity, or what today goes under the name of autonomous or secular person. You must also keep in mind that the triple way of St. Bonaventure, purgative, illuminative, and, uh, and u- u- unitive, are to be inserted as an explanation of how to remedy, remedy you might say, the, the short circuit of the intellect at the end of uh, step, th- uh, step three. Why isn't the obvious obvious? obvious. And that starts the problem, problem of sin, the problem of self, uh, uh, self, uh, self-love that is not that praised by, 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 by Christ. Instead of leading further to God, the process tragically based on, oh, excuse me, I read that. Scotus' metaphysics uh, of what today, uh, Scotus' metaphysics of the rational creature or created person by intellect and will as perfectionis simpliciter simplices or pure, pure perfections in English, and Newman's phenomenal logical discussion of conscience and of assent inference in the grammar of assent, both presuppose the position of the seraphic doctor on the difference between the secularized and the contemplative intellect. You can read more in detail about that point and also the phenomenological character of Scotus's, uh, Scotus's theology and metaphysics in Walter Harris's treatment of the will as a pure perfection, and also in his critique of transcendental philosophy from a scotistic point of view. They're both available in German and one in Italian, but English readers will have to learn German or Italian to catch up with Walter Harris. The second belongs to the intellect by nature. The first is a fruit of a deliberate option blinding the intellect to the light connatural to it, that is, rendering it skeptical or agnostic in relation to those two luminous creatures which Newman speaks my creator and myself. The will is the critical, the critical question and faith. Without doubt, interiorizing and the critical question are indeed interrelated. But in this approach, the critical question, far from, uh, far from arising from a need to verify the correspondence or adequation of thought and extra mental reality, arises out of a need in the finite mind to obey the truth, to be docile, in the face of reality, above all, the reality which is God. Interiorizing is precisely how one ought to face this choice, to be intellectually humble, to sanctify one's intellect, or to be proud, self-centered, ultimately enclosed within oneself in the darkness of doubt. It is another way of speaking about and stressing the importance of the subjective or personal in knowing vis-a-vis the objective, what Newman calls the predicate of any proposition. Without this personal dimension, knowledge in the sense of a pure perfection is not possible. Therefore, an important distinction is being introduced here. Knowledge as a pure perfection ought not to be identified with any particular instance of knowing, empirical science or the Aristotelian science. There always remains something which transcends those particular instances, and that leaves, of course, our minds incapable to be lifted to the level of a divine person, of being able to see God as he is. Is that requires uh, requires grace, but nonetheless, the possibility of that elevation presupposes that already there is a kind of, if you want to, pardon the uh, the phrase, natural or relative supernaturality, not in all creatures, but precisely in the creatures endowed with those two pure perfections, actions, intellect and will. The two are related. And when they are perfectly related, we, we are dealing with the divine intellect and divine will, which are really, really identical, but formally distinct, a party, a par, a party ray, a divine. But the point is, we must also consider the finite intellect and the finite realm. This is where Newman comes in. This is where the phenomenology of Scotus is so important. There is an element of which is simple. Radically, it just centers on what, uh, what uh, Newman calls the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the ascent. It centers around, as it were, the mystery of that univocal concept of being, which is not simply a logical concept. It's a logical concept, but it's incomparable. 
all other concepts can be compared, but not the other way around. There's a certain surplusage. There's a certain asymmet- asymmetrical element uh, in, 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 involved there. Uh, how do you consider all those, the first, second, third acts, uh, that actually what uh, New- uh, Newman has in the grammar of ascent corresponds to the first, second, third. We have the uh, apprehensive knowledge. We have the judge, uh, ju- uh, judgment or, or the, uh, uh, the uh, if you wish, the conclusion or the ascent in logical, uh, logical form. And finally, you have the inference. All these points uh, lead to a complexity. No question at all about it. The complexity, however, as it were, doesn't explain the simplicity. This is where the need, as it were, to enter in into, as it were, metaphysics, that is, which is beyond the phys- physical, beyond that which is merely an object of, of, of the senses. And if Dr. Noon pointed out, well, deal with the point that uh, we really don't know the singular as singular except intellectually. And we don't love merely by emoting about something being sentimental. Uh, the act of love is equally a simple a- act. The affectio justitiae as contrasted with the affectio comedy. Uh, the desire for justice simply because it's just. And the desire or the tendency, as it were, to love what is, what is only relative. What fulfills me, however good it, uh, uh, good, good it, uh, good, good it uh, may be. Strictly speaking, when you deal with the simple, there's not the emotional. All of this has bearing on the relationship between what Newman calls natural faith and infused faith. And curiously, that's the same term, although they deal with different aspects, it's the same terminology that we find in Scotus. Natural faith and infused faith. What is the relationship between, uh, between them? A great deal of the answer to the questions raised by, the, on the one hand, the evangelicals, uh, uh, that faith has no relation, as it were, to, uh, to reason, and those uh, uh, raised by the, uh, the, uh, uh, the evidentialists, uh, as Father, 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 put, uh, Father uh, put, put it, that uh, uh, you can't be sure of anything unless you prove it. And that's exactly the point that Newman is making. Inference however strong it may be, is not to be confused with assent. There is a personal element uh, in, involved always. The necessity in Aristotelian science, uh, is a, is a science, science by itself, as it were, does not explain the personal element that is present in an act of knowing as such, and it doesn't, much less does it explain the personal element involved in an act of willing as, as, as such. And it has nothing to do with saying that I will merely because it pleases me. That's exactly what Scotus is, uh, is denying. Uh, it, it is with, the, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with that that we are concerned here. But I'm afraid I'm, I'm, uh, my extemporaneous comments are burning up a lot of, uh, a, a lot of time. So I have to sk- uh, skip through. I'm on page five right now. And I've got to get to 18 in 10 minutes. <laughs> so that's a five from 18, well, about a half a minute a page. Very simply put, what I'm simply saying here, the critical question so much talked about today, eh, do, it does arise, but it arises not from the intellect as a faculty which operates naturally. Both Bonaventure and uh, Sistan, it's a natural operation, and therefore, as a merely natural operation, is determined by its object. Uh, 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 by its object. It arises, however, because the Personal assent is also a personal act, act, and that involves uh, invo- involves uh, involves the uh, the uh, the will. We must uh, consider how the intellect, in some way, is is personal when it knows with certainty, and we must consider, in some way, how the will is rational, rational when it, when it takes the initiative, uh, decide this is what I want, this is what I uh, uh, what I uh, will. I will the good, or I will something that happens to please me. Those are the two basic uh, ba- basic possibilities. When I refuse to to will, will what I know in my conscience, that's to use Newman's terms, or what I know, as St. Bonaventure says, by entering into myself, uh, uh, I won't acknowledge that the heart is speaking to heart at this, uh, at the, uh, at this, uh, at this point. Then a critical question in the Kantian, but it doesn't have to arise in the Kantian sense. Kant assumed that we must begin within and end within in, uh, in some way. Bonaventure and Scotus don't begin that way. That's only as were the middle passing over from this world to the, to the next. And this is where we must ourselves begin to make a personal act, where so far as it is personal, it can be called faith in a broad sense. Faith. But it also makes it possible to recognize, recognize a higher form of faith that is infused or inspired uh, faith, which enables us, as we're without evidence, 
to accept and begin to think about and reason about the, the things of uh, uh, the things uh, things that have been re- re- revealed to us. This is why it's so important to, uh, if Scotus, as it were, for his phenomenology of the intellect uh, tends especially to the human intellect of Christ. He has a precedent in St. Bonaventure. Question four of the disputed questions on the knowledge of Christ, where is the most elaborate explanation of what he calls the theory of divine illumination. And what I will simply say here as I go along is to be found uh, precisely in scotistic notion of the intellect as a pure, perf- uh, as a pure per- uh, perfection. There is something unique in that uh, first concept, if you uh, 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 wish, uh, wish, it's not only, as it were, a notional apprehension, it is a real appre- apprehension, apprehension, very mysterious and very different from all of the others that we have, but nonetheless, as it were, has to, has to be dealt with. If you don't want to deal with that, then we should close the books and not pay any more attention, as it were, to the discussions of, the, of theology, because we're only talking about, about a, an emotive experience or a kind Kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, in- intellectual rationalistic uh, 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 symbolization of interior experiences and so forth. The Lumen himself in the fourth uh, uh, fourth discourse and the second part of the idea of a university describes without the name exactly what is goes under the heading later on after his death of 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 of, 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 of modern, modernism here is a passage from newman which is very in, in, interesting it's taken from the oxford university system faith is properly assent and an assent without doubt or a certitude faith is an acceptance of things as real it's a very general notion of faith but uh, i think it has to be assumed just as the notion of being otherwise we can't carry on the, uh, carry on theology Faith simply accepts testimony. Faith is not identical with its grounds and its objects. Faith starts with probabilities, and yet it ends in, in a peremptory statement. It believes an informant amid doubt, yet accepts this information without doubt. Uh, with, without doubt. All ways of pointing out that whenever we use our minds, minds, there is an element of contemplation, there is an element of faith, a docility to the truth as, uh, as such. It's not saving faith, but it's still a presupposed by it. And in his uh, grammar of uh, sense, since in accepting a conclusion, there is a virtual recognition of his premises. An act of faith may be said improperly to include in it the reasoning process, which is its, which is its antecedent, and to be in a certain uh, respect an exercise of reason. And this is coordinate and in contrast with the three improper senses of the word reason above in, uh, ab- ab- above in, uh, in, 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 enumerated. And it goes on to give other examples. I'll let you read them. Uh, reads them himself, but it it converges on the point that I've been been, been making. Our natural exercise of our intellectual uh, powers always revolves about a a faith. If you you begin with a a reverence, a contemplation of the truth, Scotus says this explicitly, you can find the text in Horace's uh, volume, volume, and it ends at that point where revealed theology can uh, begin. Philosophy ends where the theologian starts. It ends with God. God. A God who can be suspected of having revealed something uh, possibly as he presents the point. The theologian begins with God and comes to understand the things that God has made, how they have been made, what is their order, and why they can be made. You will find that in the first part, first chapter of the Prevaloquium. It's a a very neat and a still valid explanation of the relationship between natural knowledge knowledge and the knowledge that comes through faith, but is uh, penetrated to a certain extent by reason. It brings us to the point where we will actually engage in supernatural uh, uh, contemplation, which is another matter on which uh, St. Bonaventure is the the matter. Obviously, uh, this this involves, of course, not only a study of the intellect, but also a study of the the will and various theories. Well, there are three basic uh, theories, we might say, that uh, explain explain the will. We have the, the, the one that considers it an intellectual appetite. appetite. That is the explanation which is, which is uh, a, a common to be found in the traditional Thomistic uh, a, a expo- expositions. You have the views of, starting with Occam, Occam and uh, particularly as were epitomized uh, in, in, in Kant, uh, that the will is basically autonomous to be the w- will. I can do what I want. What I want, 
if I want it, as it were, simply because it is, uh, it is what I consider to be, uh, be, be just or equality call duty, therefore that is right. Right. It doesn't matter what it uh, leads to this, that, and the other, other thing. And then you have the position, it's also in Bonaventure, before we get to get, get to Scotus, the will not as an arbitrary faculty doing it, but the will as the affectio, the tendency will as the affectio justitiae, the tendency to love the good simply because it's good to love the good. It's good to be just, uh, be, be just. Not because it brings me salvation in the first instance, not because it brings me psychological fulfillment, not because it uh, fosters my, my career, but simply because this is the right thing because God is doing it. God who, uh, this is what it means to have an orderly will. To exercise only the affectus comedy, and this is the confusion, this is the reason Scott is criticized as the concept of the will merely as an intellectual appetite. Even if it's a legitimate good, it's an arbitrary action. That's not freedom. Uh, freedom. It's merely self-indulgence. And I think that has to be kept in mind to understand. Now, if you read especially the sixth sermon in the Oxford University sermons, you will find, as it were, that Newman talks about, about goodness and, uh, uh, and mer mercy, uh, uh, mer mercy and purity in God, as in the same way as Scotus talks about the affectio justitiae, and it's not only, as it were, he calls it benevolence, Scotus would call it advantageous, uh, 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 advantageous, he says there's a difference between these, uh, these, uh, these two, and it is not not entirely natural for us only to love in view of benevolence, either being benevolent to someone or have finding someone who will be benevolent, benevolent to me. I think, as it were, you have a, a neat, uh, homiletic, uh, uh, up-to-date presentation of what SCOTUS means in more metaphysical language by that, by that distinction, which is also to be found in slightly different terminology in St. Uh, Saint, uh, Saint Bonaventure. But uh, the, 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 that's the first point that I, uh, uh, I w w wish to make. And the second is, if we apply, uh, apply the, uh, the metaphysics of SCOTUS, we shall see it is not only to explain how the human will functions and what bearing that has upon the critical que uh, uh, question, uh, difficulties in resolving questions of, of doubt, doubt uh, and consequent upon that uh, dis uh, dis uh, despair, but how these two, intellect and will, are related in God. Why is the divine will always reasonable? Why is it always orderly? Or, 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 or. The reason is because the divine intellect always presents the truth about goodness to the divine will. But the presents that precisely because it is love of goodness which is the ultimate uh, uh, pur pur purpose. In the same that the more our intellects present the good itself, or as Scotus will say, the good that is God to us, and this is what is achieved through rev revelation, and this is what is exemplified precisely in the incarnation, the more we will be able to love our neighbor as ourselves as God does. That is the heart of charity when, uh, when Scotus talks about the primacy. Not doing as we please, that if I were God and I did this, then that would be right and no longer a sin. And Scotus would say, that's not my position on the, on the matter. I may discuss the possibility of doing that, but it doesn't mean that God, when he acts, acts, only in, acts ever in an absolute fashion. He always acts in an orderly way, although I may not understand the reasons. I think you'll find in one of the prayers of Newman, uh, uh, Newman, uh, Newman, a very interesting reflection upon that. He knows what he is about, I do not, but it's enough as a word that I believe him, that I hope in him, and that there will be at least a link my, up between between persons. Anyway, uh, anyway, I'll have to finish now because I, uh, the third, uh, 45 minutes is almost uh, almost up. Uh, almost up. I have a number of notes on the Franciscan epistemology. I insist that in the importance of analyzing in this matter the itinerarium, the three uh, three, uh, three ways uh, dupl uh, duplicated through and in the vessels, through and in the image, through and in the very name of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of God. It's not the beatific vision by any stretch of the imagination, but here I call your attention to per speculum, where discursive reasons uh, are made, and in speculo, which sums up very much what is meant by the contemplative element involved in any ascent to the truth of God's existence, to the attributes that we can know, uh, uh, we, we can know, know, know about, about, about him. And the final comment, uh, comment towards the end is on 
anthology. I don't think St. Bonaventure uh, or uh, Blessed Scotus, or for that matter, St. Anselm, would be very happy with the term. It indicates that you can indeed do, this is St. Thomas's reason for rejecting uh, uh, reactionists, it seemed to be proceeding by mere logical analysis of a concept to the existent, uh, ex existence. Uh, 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 Apose ad esse non valet elatio. The axiom still remains true. You can't argue from the possibility to the fact. But what you can do is point out that this particular concept is not simply a, a, con a, con a, con a concept, but it involves, as it were, intuitive knowledge of some kind. Uh, uh, of, of some kind. This is uh, more or less what you find also in Newman with his analysis of, of, of the conscious. I encounter someone, I don't know who it is, but I'm certainly afraid of him, especially after I've committed several, uh, several murders. Uh, what's going to happen to me? I, I can try to drown all of that out up to a point that is, uh, that is possible. It still remains true that the natural instinct there, and it's not a pure sense in, in instinct I'm talk, uh, talking about, about is, it already has indicated something to me that I cannot effectively uh, de deny. I can run to the ends of the seashore in the poem of Francis Thompson, The, the Hound, of, Hound of Heaven. There he is before me. I, I come face to face with the same, uh, same, 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 same difficulty. I think the English friars gave an accurate estimate of Scotus on this particular point, the last of the ancients that understood precisely, precisely the difference between abstractive, purely logical, inferential point of view, and intuitive uh, cognition. And Occam's the first of the moderns, or modernists, we would say, hey, that's an oversimplification uh, and probably an abuse of terms, but it indicates, as were, a keen perception of a radical change. Uh, uh, change. I just want to mention one other thing, uh, thing that will be helpful for following the rest of the discussion uh, tomorrow, tomorrow. Very often we speak of objectification, the need to form a concept uh, an image of some of some kind, uh, and to think about what we uh, what we know initially by intu uh, in uh, intuition that something is, something is many things as the word therefore become very very uh, very removed from from that immediate contact with uh, with reality. But there's another consideration. I've never come across it in Newman, but I certainly have come across it in both both Bonaventure and Scotus, and I noticed that um, uh, Bunois in his book, Etre et Representation, underscores the point. The process of, uh, uh, Newman at least says, it's very important not to reject notional apprehension and notional assent. We couldn't think if we didn't have, uh, uh, have that. But it also as it reflects, as it were, what is unique to the Christian concept of knowing not only an idea, but a concept because of the begetting of the word of God uh, by the Father from all e eternity not in order to know because he knows. And in that sense, Bonaventure is right, right, uh, right, that the structure of the soul and the sense that we have of the various operations of the soul, particularly in thinking, in, mem uh, in exercising memory, the first contact with the frontal illu illu illumination, the, ex the, the exercise of thinking is also important. Uh, important. He distinguishes that from the, mem uh, from the memory precisely in view of the begetting of a word. Right? Uh, and without in our present conditions, the power to abstract uh, and to reason in, for, uh, uh, reason in this fashion, we would not be able, as it were, to as it were, conceive the, uh, the, the uh, word. And then, of course, he explains loving in the same way. The, the, the me memory representing the father, the word representing the son, come together in the, uh, in the love of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Uh, yeah. There's been a lot of criticism of it, but it is a point at work that I think has, a, uh, has an ancient patristic, uh, patristic basis, and it's well to keep it in mind to appreciate fully what these great uh, thinkers, in one, however they came to this uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge, actually made, uh, made use in order to understand what they're talking about when they talk about questions, questions of the nature of the intellect, the nature of the will, and all the various complex forms of knowing and loving that uh, that we come uh, that we come across. Thank you for the. Father Peter, thank you. My one comment is to go back to that marvelous reference you made when you and Father 
Charles Balich were discussing the possibilities of, of doing some studies on the connections between SCOTUS and Newman. And you recognized Father Balich, OFM, as the foremost SCOTUS of the, of the century. And then you talked about the importance of doing something like that. Well, you have begun to do that right now for our audience here and who are watching us at home. But what they don't know is that these 28 pages, of which you went over a few at the beginning and will pick up again tomorrow, that's part of 90 pages. And what else they don't know is that there's another 52 pages that were done in 1978, more or less hidden away, that have now been re-edited and brought forward. And those 52 pages are extremely important because they elaborate even more what you're saying to us to understand what you're saying here, what you've been reading, and the 90 pages. My point is this. You have done what Father Balich and you have talked about in 1966. Thank you very much for uh, your elaboration of the harmonization of intellect, will, and the good. And it, it, it struck me how possibly parallel that was to uh, what Dr. Noon raised. And I'd like to ask you this question. Oh, and it's, this has to do with um, the content of the intellect and how this might relate to uh, the intuition, as Professor Noon, I, I, I believe, described it, and that is, um, and you you mentioned you you briefly touched on this at the end, and that is uh, the capacity to form an image, mm -hmm. which informs the intellect, yeah. uh, and it, it it reminded me of of how striking that was, for example, in in Baltazar's work. Uh, of his vision of Christ as the aesthetic center of creation, mm -hmm. and how that that image is of is what informs the intellect, yes. which then leads to the identification mm -hmm. of truth and which then motivates the will so it, it would you say that 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 correlates with what yeah, Professor Noon was talking about in terms of <laughs> we're on the same wavelength. The, oh, good. There's <laughs> no question at all that what, what I am saying complements to a great degree. I'm simply not going over all of the text, which you'll find in Dr. Noon's presentation. Uh, the text of Scotus on these points, points and Bonaventure before him are well known, well known. But no one has given much consideration to a very different format, very different purpose, if you know, I say, but to the metaphysics. And more than that, the dogmatic theology, theology which underscores Newman's, uh, Newman's adaptation of all of these things to the needs of his contemporaries, our contemporaries, to us, basically. And this is all I mean by saying that I think Newman has put into modern language what Scotus was talking about for his, his times in a different style, in the, uh, the abstruse, dry, met, uh, metaphysical la uh, language. Uh, some people say, I can't see anything theological in, in, in Scotus. But all the metaphysics in Scotus is in service of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the theology. It's my opinion, and somewhere in these pages, and later on in the in the dis, uh, discussions in the second and the third third part, I point out it's very easy if you look at it this way to see that concept, univocal concept of being, being ends. Ends, you might uh, might say, which explains why all of this is possible. Yet, uh, no instance of knowledge that we have naturally realizes the potential content of our in intellects. More so, the will, which, in a certain sense, opens on the uh, on the uh, on the infant. But go back to the convert. Uh, 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 univocal concept of being with the disjunctive transcendentals. Let's just take infinite and finite, divine and uh, and created. Doesn't that suggest, as it were, the structure of the uh, definition of the hypostatic, uh, hypostatic union? Yeah. One divine person, two natures. One nature is divine, the other nature is human. That is the microcosm. All the rest of creation, in a certain sense, is summed up. 
And this is why I say that uh, Newman was so sympathetic to Scotus, particularly on the question of the sacramentality of the, uh, of the, of the world, which is basically a, a theme of, uh, of, the, uh, of the fathers, fathers of the church, in particular, Cyril of Alexandria, whom, uh, whom uh, uh, Newman studied closely, but Cyril of Alexandria happens to be one of the patristic sources. I don't know if uh, Scotus read him, but the fact is it was illustrated many years ago in an essay written for the Alma, uh, Alma Soci Christi, uh, 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 Christi by, uh, by an um, observant fire. Uh, I can't think of his name. Uh, name. I quote him, quote him in here. here. All of the basic uh, aspects of the absolute primacy of Christ and with it Our, Our Lady are to be found in, in, uh, in Cyril of Alexandria. And there are many, many other fathers of the church who are basically provide a basis, a starting point for the views of scholars. He didn't invent them. <laughs> he didn't uh, come across them. Anyway, you're quite right in, in, say, in, in, say, in saying that, uh, that the potential of our intellects is uh, you know, it's the, the proper object of the human intellect is not the being of uh, it's that, and all, all that we can arrive at knowledge by reasoning to it. Any intellect, finite as well as divine, opens on the whole of being. But the natural powers that we have in order to, in order to, uh, to realize our potential are not adequate to, to, to that. Uh, if the Lord wants us to, well, he'll give us the grace. Otherwise, there remains a certain tension. You will not find this approach to natural and supernatural in St. Thomas. He bases it, it was an innovation of his day, on the distinction between the proper object of the human, the proper object of the angelic intellect, and the proper object of the divine in, in, in intellect. Neither Bonaventure nor Scotus will admit of that. There's distinction, a distinction between natural and supernatural Upon, based upon a personal act of God. How much is he going to reveal of him, uh, himself? It's up to him to decide that. He doesn't have to make us for heaven. He could have made it. But the fact is, he did. Why did he? The answer comes, the absolute primacy of Christ. He made the whole of creation, and especially the human fa uh, family, for the glory of Christ and his blessed, uh, blessed, blessed mother. This is the, this is the, very, uh, the centerpiece of the, of the pre 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 present, uh, presentation. So when you deal with the sacramentality in, 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 you know, in Newman, you're immediately into Scotism. It's clear from his treatment of natural and revealed religion. Once you see clearly that what the terminology of Scotus and before him Bonaventure on the distinction natural, supernatural, nature, and grace, grace, you will understand what Newman is getting at. He's not saying any one particular natural religion is particularly good. He admits de facto that there are many abuses. But the notion of natural religion, uh, as God intended it, is the basis for revealed religion. It has nothing to do with modern universal uh, universal. I think that is a very important point. You will find it expounded at prolongum et latum in the idea of, uh, of a university. You will find it in the, uh, the concluding part, a very long part, of the grammar of ascent, uh, ascent, illustrating how you proceed from natural faith to infused faith, from natural religion to revealed uh, uh, re re religion, or in Scotistic, from natural to, su uh, to, to, to super, uh, 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 supernatural. And this explains why Newman, even as an Anglican, was so uh, uh, attracted to Scotistic theories, prominent at the Council of uh, Trent, of showing how, at that time he wanted to show how the fundamental teaching of the, uh, the Anglicans, or the high Anglican uh, of, of the uh, Oxford, Oxford party, was really identical with the Catholic position, uh, position, even though it didn't correspond to that of the Thomas. And the church had never condemned people like Cornelius Busso and, uh, and, and company. Anyway, that's a little bit more on that point. Professor Archambault has a question. This is more of a uh, question asking what you, what you think of, uh, of what I'm about to say. Um, I see as one basic difference between Newman and Scotus the presence of the heart. Mm -hmm. Now, in the epistemological panoply, if I, if I may say, call it that, of uh, scholasticism, the heart, I believe plays no role. You have intellect and will, etc. I, I see the heart as uh, a, an a, a epistemological means of access to God and to Christ, coming around with, well, more in uh, poetic literature, mm 
uh, the 16th century, I think, of St. John of the Cross. Uh, Christ revealed himself to Margaret Mary in the 17th century as the Sacred Heart. I don't think there was any devotion to the Sacred Heart much before the 17th century. And I see it in Newman. I think uh, without uh, citing a specific text, mm -hmm. I think he does often mention the heart as a means of access to Christ. Of course, it's probably and, more of a myth. So, so does St. Bonaventure. So does, so does St. Bonaventure, very much so. We still read one of the lessons from St. Bonaventure for the solemnity of the sacred Does it play a role? Does it play a role in... in Not only that, but his teaching on the heart of our heart of our, 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 our lady in the Franciscan school, in fact, his three scholars, is, and with his thesis on absolute primacy, is simply explaining St. Francis's position about the kingship and the queenship of Mary, which is closely connected with the patristic and also biblical no, notion of, uh, of, of heart. That is true. You don't find a thesis in the neo-scholastic sense of the term in Bonaventure, much less in Scotus, to the effect this is, this is what the heart of the heart is. But what they mean by heart is not merely the center of, of affection, but when entering into the heart for St. Bon Bon Bonaventure means entering into yourself. He's talking about mm. the, the, mm. the person, and what he's talking about without quite getting core, a core locator of, uh, 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 in the uh, in in, uh, in, uh, in chapters 3 and 4 of the Itinerarium is precisely precisely our hearts opening up to the heart of the heart of God. If you look at his other treatments, other mystical works, you see that's exactly what what he means there. And he would <coughs> heartily approve of the of the usage of the term heart by, by because there's one with him. The other point I would make there is that Saint Francis de Sales, when he was a student of theology in pa Padua, was under the influence of a uh, of a prominent Scotus professor of theology uh, there, later the Minister General of the con con Conventuals and the Bishop of Caria. Uh, 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 Cariate. Does it, does it, anyway, you talked about spiritual fraternity. I'm going, going to have to inter, I'm going to have to interrupt here only so that we stay with our schedule. The other is to invite everyone to the uh, panel. We'll pick this up at the panel because look at how animated the discussion is. It's it's difficult to have to break it, but it is time for a meal, and uh, uh, then we'll come back at at eight o'clock for the panel. So thank. You very much and we'll keep the discussion going okay okay